Hello, my name is Bird Running Water, and I belong to the Cheyenne and Mescalero Apache Nations. I'm honored to be welcoming you to our reimagined Sundance Film Festival coming from the indigenous lands of North America. I'd like to pay a special tribute to the Ute Tribal Nation, the Lenni Lenape Nation, and the Tongva people. We thank them all for giving Sundance Institute our homes. I would also like to honor the indigenous lands and people from where you are joining us. Please enjoy the show. Ikehet Ahanaka. Good evening, I'm Clark Weens, co-founder and president of the Circle Cinema Board. Welcome to the Circle Cinema and to the Admiral Twin Driving, who have something in common. They were both featured in the Tulsa's film of The Outsiders. Welcome also to Sundance Film Festival 2021, hosted by your Circle Cinema, Tulsa's non-profit theater. We thank you always for your attendance, especially during the pandemic your safety comes first. Circle Cinema opened in 1928, 93 years old, and is looking forward to its 100th birthday. Community conscious through film, the Circle motto, is well supported by the independent films that the Sundance Film Festival brings to the world. Having the festival here in Tulsa helps to complete that circle. Historically, Circle Cinema has worked with many other nonprofit organizations to bring awareness to their mission and to work with them to make Tulsa a better place to live. In keeping with that tradition, Circle Cinema is donating 100% of proceeds from the Sundance general admission tickets to the 1921 Race Massacre Centennial Commission and will work with them to facilitate actions, activities, and events that commemorate and educate all citizens. Thanks again for your, all your support in keeping the circle part of Tulsa's culture now and in the future. as well known as George Washington, as far as I'm concerned. Notice how there's no one around here. No one, very few people. Oh, this is so surreal. Oh my God, holy cow. This is freaking cool. <laughs> my heroes were in this building. It's really hard for me not to just ugly cry right now. This is a huge part of American history. This building, this place, this town, and we're in here by ourselves. Women's history needs more attention than this.
my name's Marilyn Artis, and I'm a artist from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I always love highlighting women within my work. And years ago, I read a book about the suffrage movement, and I fell in love with that era. I met all these women I'd never, ever heard about, and I was just hooked to the suffrage history. When I realized the big 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment was coming up, I knew I wanted to do something really big. After the last presidential election, it was so contentious, and I really felt like everybody needed to serve their country and do something positive. And how I could serve my country was I could make art. I could make powerful, positive art that would impact women and history. Her flag is happening. It's not just something I've been dreaming about for two years. It's actually happening. You're going to Albany, New York. I said that right, right, right? Did I say that right? I'm just going to so many places I've never been before. Just this incredible journey to see this country coast to coast. Her Flag is a travel art project to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. I came up with this idea of traveling to all 36 states that ratified the 19th Amendment in order over 14 months, 17 separate trips on and off the road, and I've collaborated with a woman artist in each state, and they have created artwork that has been turned into a stripe, and we're making a flag that has 36 stripes one for each of the ratifying states. They're sewn in order of ratification, which makes the travel super crazy, but that's the magic of it. It's a good thing I know Boston like that. Oh, so hand. good, so good you know Boston. Use the right two lanes to keep right onto Beacon Street. Use uh, any lane to turn Okay, you have right two navs going at the same time. I guess I do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the oldest buildings in the United States, so it's incredible to sew Massachusetts stripe here in this historic building. History nerding out a little bit, loving it. <laughs> so this is Carrie Percival, and she is the artist that created the artwork to represent Massachusetts. So I did like a historical freeze style it's because a lot of 18th and 19th century art is in that style. There's such a treasure trove of history of people strategizing and being creative and working on this thing from all different angles. There's so many people that came before us. It's so inspiring. The first people to protest in front of the White House were the suffrage fighters, and this was scandalous. They were spit on, they were knocked down, they were yelled at, they were arrested, and they stood vigil for months on end. Born in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, the suffrage movement, in the words of leader Carrie Chapman Catt, was a long story of hard work and heartaches, but it was crowned by victory in the 19th Amendment, the right of women to vote. When the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, not all women magically were voting. It was largely white, wealthier women. Women of color, Asian American, African American, Native women were not granted the right to vote. There were laws in all the 50 states that were a little different, and each group of women had to be fought for to get their right to vote. It wasn't until 1965 and the Voting Rights Act was passed that all women would have the right to vote in the United States. It was really important to me that this flag had equal representation of white women and women of color. Women of color were a critical part of the struggle for the passing of the 19th Amendment. When most people think of the suffrage fight in the United States, they don't think about the role that Native American women played. Early suffrage fighters Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott spent time with the Haudenosaunee people of the Six Nations Confederacy in New York State. Women in all these tribes were equal to men and played roles in governing and decision-making at the highest levels in their communities. Stanton, Mott, and other suffrage fighters were inspired by the women leaders of the native tribes and wanted equality for themselves. 
At this time in America, when women got married, they relinquished all rights to their husbands and were not considered equal citizens. Soon after visiting the Haudenosaunee lands, they organized the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York, and thus began the women's rights movement. This is the third trip of 17 trips. We're in Austin, Texas today, and my husband Andy and my son Austin is here. We had a crazy, rough night. Emergency room was involved. Fire ants were involved. So, uh, yeah, I'm tired. Everybody make it through? Uh, I love my family, but it's made it, you know, a little challenging today. The final flag will be 18 feet by 26 feet. It's huge, very, very big. And it's made out of outdoor UV grade fabric. It's meant to hang on the outside of a building. I want it somewhere where people can see it, interact with it, and hopefully raise awareness about this anniversary. The Union or Starfield has got the big votes for women, the iconic button. So I wanted for people to instantly know this flag is about women. You know, it's 100 years since this was ratified and it's an opportunity to think about women's participation in government and democracy. What are we doing in 100 years? What do we need to work on? There she is so far! <laughs> I really hope that in talking about this, we can get more women to run for office. We all know a woman who should be running for office, and there are not enough of us in government making decisions, writing policy, and we need to be in there. A record number of women will be on the ballot Tuesday. The number of female congressional candidates has increased by 44% since 2012, and women of color have increased by 75%. Nearly half of the 50 states have never sent a woman to the Senate, and there are five that have never even sent a representative who is a female to the House of Representatives. I'm the 10th woman to ever serve our city council since 1890, and the second woman of color. When people clap and say, oh, you're the second woman of color to ever serve, I'm like, we shouldn't have this conversation in 2020. We should be well down the road uh, on 30, 40. I'm the first Asian American woman to serve in the Oklahoma legislature, and quite frankly, there weren't very many Asian women in politics across the country. It's important for us to continue to have women in these positions so other young girls can see. We want them to take the needle much further and continue to pass it along to other women in these spaces that we've continuously been told are not for us. It takes one person to make the brave step to put their name on the ballot, and I hope that some of what I've done has encouraged and inspired others to do the same. Okay, so Wisconsin was the first. The thing I love about the Her Flag Project is all of these different states have different stories about what women have contributed. It speaks to how women come together and get things done. Her Flag does a great job of bringing different types of people together to talk about what happened 100 years ago and the challenges that we still face as women. And for all communities who are disenfranchised from the process, it's very ironic that we have this conversation 100 years later and our votes are still being tested. These conversations are necessary for us to realize we have a long ways to go and that our freedoms are still at stake. With the women's suffrage movement, it proves that it could take years and decades, but that we shouldn't give up and that we have to keep working together and disrupt systems of government and processes in order to be heard and not let the conversation be the end of it. I'm here in Arkansas in this incredible historic room. It's their old Supreme Court. After the last presidential election, I was really concerned about the direction the country was going. I really wanted her flag to create a positive moment where Republican, Democrat, Independent could come feel good about American history. So we're delighted to have the first lady of the great state of Arkansas here today. Oftentimes the women were arrested for speaking out in public. 
the First Lady of Arkansas, who is a Republican woman, kicked off the event today. It's really meaningful to have a safe place for every party affiliation to come and celebrate being an American and acknowledging this really important anniversary. The other part of her flag is we always have a performing artist, so we have an incredible group of musicians here today. boys and fling it to the wind mother wife and daughter let it shelter and defend equal rights our motto is we're loyal to the end giving hey, the Daniel, ballot to up? the mothers hurrah hurrah we bring the jubilee hurrah hurrah the homes they shall be free so we'll sing the chorus from the mountains to the sea giving the ballot to the mothers there were 340 applicants, but only yes. 36 were chosen. Yes. Is that yeah. Huh? Isn't that great? Well, how did you, you know? What's it's the hard. Criteria? In some states, it was gruelingly brutal. <laughs> was it brutal to pick Well, Nicole, Nicole is amazing. Her work is incredible. Can I go give her a first Oh, hi, oh, hi sweetheart. Hi. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> um, I want to introduce Nicole LaRue, who's sitting right here, who is the artist that made the artwork for New Hampshire. Yeah. Some of her clients include the Women's March. This is the fabulous human being that created that epic logo. How does it feel to have this logo, this art that you made, have so much power behind it now and like all these feelings and emotions Super and like what does that feel it's like? It's crazy. For me, the most important part, I think it's changed my trajectory. So my two new books are on kid activists. You know, we just can't really make change until we're actually in there. We're there. Yeah. <laughs> Women and little girls are told they're different, and maybe they're not as good. When a little girl opens up her history book first time in school, she doesn't see herself very often there. And until women's stories are given their due, we're gonna have a problem from the get-go. Our world doesn't get better unless women are in the mix. We're critical components to making life better for every American. What we have to say, our opinions, how we see life is unbelievably valuable. One woman you probably haven't read about in your history books is Victoria Woodhull. She was far ahead of her time and had many revolutionary ideas about women's roles, culture, and government. Born to a poor family in rural Ohio, she was the first woman stockbroker, a clairvoyant, author, publisher, self-made millionaire, suffrage fighter, sexual revolutionary, the first woman to address the U.S. Congress, and the first woman to run for president. She worked alongside Susan B. Anthony on women's suffrage. However, Anthony found her lewd and indecent and cut the power on Woodhull's speech at the National Women's Suffrage Convention of 1871. Although Woodhull was considered a controversial figure in her day, she was an important trailblazer for generations of women to follow. There it is, see? see? Crazy so oh, so pretty. So this is my 17th state capital to see on the tour because it's the 17th stripe to go on today. Is it really 17? 17, 17 I've been, yes. 17 out of 36. Whew. I always look to see if there's any acknowledgement of women's history, if we're used just as props, as nude props. This is Utah, you're not gonna see much nudity here. Yeah, yeah. There's always a dude with a gun. Oh, we got a native woman and a baby. Yeah, that's great. As usual, it's a hall full of paintings of old white guys. There's a painting of a woman voting right here. Well, didn't Utah give women the right to vote right from the beginning? Or? Well, they were voting in state elections very early, yes. A lot of the West was like that. In this building, Utah women cast the first votes 
of the women's rights movement. We all rejoice that Utah is a state with her women free and enfranchised citizens. Ugh, oh, it just makes me cry. So this is the stripe that is representing Utah. Jan says, I wanted Utah's contribution to reflect the spirit of change and justice that female emancipation has fostered. You know, I think there are a lot of Democrats or liberal folks that kind of move away from patriotism and don't want to raise the flag or talk about. And I think that's dangerous when one party gets to own patriotism. What people worry about is that patriotism can be exclusive and it also can be very white. And the flag gets hijacked. It's a symbol and therefore it can symbolize things that become sensitive for different populations. So maybe it's time to discuss that. And perhaps that's your redefinition of the flag as it's an inclusive flag. I was probably 14 years old when I took a school trip to Washington, D.C. And the thing that really stuck with me was the Star Spangled Banner flag. It was tattered and torn, and it felt like you could see the history of the country in it. I tangibly could identify with this object in American history that I could imagine me sewing. I could imagine my mother sewing. I had watched my mother, my grandmother, my aunt sew my whole life, and I loved it. It made perfect sense to use a flag as a vehicle to celebrate this anniversary. When the suffrage fight was happening, they had a ratification banner that Alice Paul would put a star on every time a state ratified. So it just seemed like such a perfect continuation of that legacy of the American suffrage fight. Beautiful day, beautiful, beautiful sunny. Day. Gonna be an amazing, beautiful day. I am in Sacramento, California, and it's the last trip of the year. It's been challenging, and I'm really tired. I'm like a band on tour, just constantly going to a different place and having to perform. I have a chronic illness called interstitial cystitis, and it's stress triggered big time. So I'm in a lot of pain today, and uh, I'm gonna push through. My name is Marilyn Artis, and uh, I'm an artist and a suffrage era nerd and an activist from Oklahoma City. Throughout my life, things that scare me, I do. If it scares me, I jump in there because I want to learn and constantly be pushing myself to grow and be a more evolved human being. My true core is to be an introvert and to want to be alone a lot. But I really wanted to get comfortable with public speaking and being a performance artist. Everybody say suffrage. suffrage. <laughs> I learned long ago that collaborating with other people is energizing. Okay, I'm one with attitude. <laughs> it makes life and art and everything just so much more fun and enjoyable. So it's worth the, the struggle to do it. My great-great-grandmother Elizabeth Cady Stanton publicly demanded the vote in 1848. It took 72 years, but we did it. Here is the niece of Susan B. Anthony. And here we had the great-great-great-grandson of Frederick Douglass, who supported women's right to vote. With the Rose Parade on the very first day of 2020. We're in Pasadena. There are a hundred women from all over the country and we're gonna be walking with this float that Pasadena Celebrates 2020 created and we're all in our awesome suffrage costumes. <laughs>
come true to be here. To get this close to these floats, they are incredible. There are a million people that line the streets. so starved for positive energy and hope and to see that many people and look them in the eye and smile and wave and have this beautiful celebration. It's a once in a lifetime, dreamy, incredible, feminist suffrage high. The 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment is this year, 2020. So I've been to 19 states. I drove over 22,000 miles last year. What's happening today is I'm sewing the star field onto the shorter stripes. So today is when this sucker really becomes a flag. Today is the day it's gonna look like a flag, finally! <laughs> Lines. They are souvenirs from harder times. I punched out the glass when it got in my way. Well, I could see out, but it wouldn't let me stray. There we go so far. There's her plus so far. <laughs> we really want it to be hanging on the outside of a building during the next presidential election in Washington, D.C. Fast-breaking developments in the coronavirus emergency in the U.S., the number of cases soaring. New nationwide guidelines for Americans across this country in the fight against the coronavirus, urging Americans not to gather in groups larger than 10. Americans are urged not to travel unless absolutely necessary. Roughly three out of four Americans now under orders to stay home. When COVID hit, I quit driving broke my heart to not get to be in the actual state and be with the artists that made the stripe. But in the bigger picture of things, there's a lot of really rough things happening. People were dying. People were dying all over the country and the world. So I'm like, I can live stream this and this is okay. So this is my very first live stream of her, of her flag performance. Ooh, yeah, the news is tough out there. Um, it just changes minute by minute. So I'm gonna, it's it's hard to, um, it's hard to, to just go on. We're here in my hometown, Oklahoma City, um, right in my driveway. The rainbow spot of live streaming, the sewing of this was that people from all over the country could watch the streaming, which was nice. Tomorrow, I sew on the 33rd stripe, my home state and I'm pinning it on right now. We realize like, we can do this. We can have an outside event. Today, let us celebrate the good that we have sown, to know that change can come even when so much feels unknown. May we be reminded of the greatness that underdogs can do when they fight for the good of all, not some privileged few. May we go out into this day inspired by hard work meeting chance to believe that the quest for societal progress is not a losing stance. Embracing uncertainty while doing the work we can do, we move from short-sightedness to a grander, truer, all-loving view. And now Oklahoma! Woo! I love you guys! It's August 18th, and it is officially the 100th anniversary. It is the day that Tennessee passed the 19th Amendment. So we're here in Nashville, and we're going to sew this stripe on today. Welcome, everybody. We are so happy to be here today. So I am here to sew on Tennessee stripe right here, right now, live in this gorgeous auditorium. I wish you all were here with us, but you're here with us virtually. I am here with Higgins Bond, who created the Tennessee Stripe. This has been quite an honor for me to be part of this. I wanted to 
highlight some of the uh, African American women that were instrumental in the suffragette movement and the civil rights movement. Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, Rosa Parks, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer. When the 19th Amendment came about, it gave mostly white women the freedom to vote, but it still took a long time for everyone. So I wanted to highlight that struggle for, for all women. Um, because it's been a long road and we're still struggling to keep the vote. The right to vote is such a uniquely wonderful thing to America. So many people take the act of voting for granted. If this project helps to remind people of all the suffragettes that went through the harassment that they went through to get the vote, if this reminds them of that sacrifice, then maybe we're doing a really good thing. The Tennessee Strip is on! Let's hoist this sucker up. It's about education. It's about valuing women's history. When we learn about the history, then you learn to care. You learn that your voice matters. Highlighting some of these women like Ida B. Wells, I hope it will inspire this new generation of young girls. Ida B. Wells was born during the Civil War to enslaved parents. One day in 1862, at the age of 20, she boarded a train from Memphis to Woodstock, Tennessee, and decided she didn't want to sit in the blacks only section. When the conductor asked her to leave, she refused. It took three men to drag her off the train. She even bit the conductor on the hand during the fight. She sued the railroad company and was awarded damages. However, the verdict was overturned during an appeal. In 1913, during the National Suffrage Parade in Washington, D.C., she and the other black suffrage fighters were told to march in the back so as not to upset the Southern delegates. In the midst of the chaos of the parade, Wells joined the white suffragettes in the front and walked alongside them to represent her state of Illinois. This is the inaugural exhibition of her flag and uh, couldn't be a better place for it to be. It's a absolute dream come true for her flag to premiere on the Clinton Presidential Library on the day the 19th Amendment was federally enrolled into the Constitution. It feels very surreal, like somebody pinched me. Having her flag on the side of the library is just an incredibly special opportunity. The ability to vote, not just a right, but a responsibility. It's not hyperbole to say that people died yes. for our right to vote, literally. The story of women's suffrage is overlooked. To see that reflected in, in her flag, I hope that it serves as an inspiration. Getting the vote is not the end, it's just the beginning. We're fighting for equal pay. We're fighting for equal access to education. We're still fighting this fight. This story doesn't end. Her flag doesn't end. This is only the beginning of this journey. I think about Betsy Ross or any of these objects at the Smithsonian and the people that made them. The history that they made became part of our legend and our story. I hope her flag can continue to educate and, and raise awareness about women's history and voting. This election, there's a lot at stake. Americans forget how voting is power. Voting is how we change things. There is a band of women, and to our manner born, emerging from the darkness past and looking toward the morn. Their mothers labored, waited through a night without a star. The morning shows a suffrage flag that bears a woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. This band is for all reforms, war shall be at an end. Bayonets and swords shall rust, we'll use the brain, the pen. Laden with precious freight, now thunders on the progress car. At the headlight waves a suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. 
A ship of state for ages was guided by starlight Till the cluster in our flag almost dispelled the night Tis freedom's day, our flag shall be a sun no night can mar We'll add the light of the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star Thus evolves the grandest triumph of dual human race. Church and state, the home and school, and law and love embrace. We'll have a perfect nation, we'll march from near and far. To glory neath the stars and stripes, it shall bear the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the stars and stripes, it shall bear the woman's star. All right, so thank you all for um, being here and talking about um, Her Flag, which is this fantastic short documentary that um, I had the privilege of being one of the producers for. And I wanted to introduce our panel. Um, we have, of course, Marilyn Artis, the um, creator of Her Flag um, and um, uh, Congresswoman, I'm sorry, Councilwoman, <laughs> not yet, <laughs> soon to be, um, Councilwoman Nikki Nice of Oklahoma. Hi, thank you so much for being here. And two of the artists who um, have participated in the beautiful flag, um, Nikki, uh, Nicole LaRue and Higgins Bond. All right. And thank you. This is such a great conversation. Thank so you. To talk about this project. Um, I just wanted to start Glad off to be part of it. Thank you. Um, Marilyn, I just wanted to start off and talk to you about sort of the, the idea of um, making a film to document the project. How did that all happen? How did that get started? Yeah, so, you know, in coming up with this monstrous idea, this large scale project uh, to channel my frustrations with politics in the United States, <laughs> um, you know, the, the project just told, you know, was like, told me it, it needed to have a film. There were going to be so many components that could be so interesting, all these different artists and locations. And there were just so many opportunities to meet really fast, fantastic people and have cool stories that evolve. So it just made perfect sense to, to, to document this project. Yeah. And did you feel that, um, in making the film, did that change the way her flag was presented in any way? Did it change your ideas about the project? Thinking about this other entity there as well? Yeah. I, you know, I really don't think that it did. I think that I just, you know, I, I planned out her flag, you know, for a year before I ever started doing anything. Um, so I think it was, it was pretty set and I just tried to ignore, you know, the cameras and not pay attention to it as much as I could. Yeah. Um, and I, can you talk a little bit about just the um, kind of the inception of uh, reaching out to the artists and the performers and how did that all happen? And what was the process like for that? So we put a call for artists on callforentry.org, which is a great platform. A lot of artists know to go there. And then we also contacted all the um, local, the state arts organizations and told them about the project and had them help push out the call as well. So we did a lot of legwork to get, um, to get the call out, to get artists interested. And we had over 340 artists apply, which was fantastic. Um, it was a, a, a lot of artists to pick, so quite a panelist that selected the artists and, uh, you know, her flag, I never talk about it as an I thing anymore. Um, it's always we, cause there's just so many people that were involved in making the project and the film happen. So that's great. And Nicole, how did you hear about her flag? I feel like. I feel like maybe Marilyn reached out to me. Um, I know, did I? It's been so long. I don't know, I know. Like, I'm like, what is the answer to that question? Do I know? I feel like that that might have happened. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm like, 
now that we're talking about it i don't know <laughs> i think we so we went on instagram some of the some of the crew and scoured you know just graphics things that we loved and then we contacted people through instagram maybe we did i think we may have contacted maybe, and then to apply from there yeah. or something yeah. Yeah. And of course I was like, yeah, I'm going to apply. Are you kidding? <laughs> like, had I not heard of it, I would have been so disappointed. Right. I mean, this is like a dream project to be a part of. It seems like Nicole, your work, you know, the graphics and um, very sp spoke very much to this project. Did you feel that, you know, immediately that connection or did you have an envision of what you wanted to do? I think, yeah, kind of right away. I didn't really like Tr have to like try too hard for this one it just felt like just like an easy reach kind of thing and I don't know and, and collaborating with Marilyn I don't know like that lady you know Marilyn I don't know you just have like the best kind of energy that's just so good and I like the way you interact with people and treat people and like include people it was just perfect honestly for me so yeah yeah yeah, Marilyn, talk a little bit about that, the process of collaborating with the different artists and how that went. I mean, everyone was, you know, you talking to people in all different states and you were, did you ever get together with them physically or was it always over, you know, Zoom or the phone or? Yeah, I was Zooming before it was even a thing because when you have, <laughs> when you're working with artists from all over the country um, and I really wanted to have little conversations with them. So when, when the artists were selected, we had little um, like seven or eight of them at a time and just talked about the project. And I got to hear their voices and listen to their concerns and answer questions they had. So um, yeah, I, I definitely, you know, part of the joy of this project was getting to meet all these amazing women artists, um, you know, and I was so glad I got to go be with Higgins um, in Tennessee for that last stripe because with COVID I had gone home and was live streaming as 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 we saw and uh, to get to meet her um, and be with her to sew that final stripe stripe on was so so special yeah absolutely yeah Higgins can you talk yeah, about it was oh, for me too go ahead go ahead T tell us about the process tell us about getting involved with the project how did you first hear about it Well, I on and we kind of got to know, know each other a little bit, but you know, the thing I love most about this is that Marilyn gave the assignment basically and just kind of let us go with it. Uh, I remember doing sketches and sending in a sketch to let her approve, you know, what I was planning to do. But I think each individual artist kind of used their own voice basically to create what they wanted and. Um, I was happy that, you know, they approved the sketch the way I originally did it. And um, there was no, you know, correct this, change this, move this. <laughs> As an illustrator, I'm used to working with art directors and they kind of tell you exactly the way they want you to do things. But uh, there was a lot of creative freedom with this. And I remember when I first uh, got invited to participate in this, the first thing I thought of was the AIDS quilt. Yeah, I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was such a symbolic thing. And I thought it was a wonderful way to get a lot of artists together to show their individual voices and their own expression about uh, the suffrage movement. So I was really happy to participate in it. That's great. Yeah, that's so interesting that you um, make that parallel because I feel like that is also, you know, a very emotional, um, politically driven, but also like has, I mean, what I love about the quill or the flag is that um, you see so much individuality, but also it's, it's so cohesive. And there's so much of like a singular yeah. voice, even though it's coming from 36 different artists, plus Marilyn, plus, you know, um, that's something that's really mm -hmm. quite beautiful. In in the conversations that you were having, Marilyn, with the you know six or seven of the different artists, was there um, brainstorming and collaboration amongst the artists as well? 
Um, we used uh, Basecamp as a platform to communicate with each other. And so there definitely was that it was happening there where they were posting sketches and seeing what each other were doing and able to talk to each other. So that was where kind of that occurred. And the only instruction they were really given was to keep it positive and celebratory. So um, any, you know, feelings about things that were happening just, you know, to keep this celebratory about this particular achievement in American history and, and reflecting mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. And it's also interesting that um, I'm sure each artist comes with their own ideas of you know, their own political ideas, their own ideas from where, from whoever they are. And there's one line in the film that really struck me um, when Jan Hath Hawthorne from um, Utah said that patriotism feels, can feel exclusive. And it can feel like it is owned by only one group of people or one set of ideals. And I feel like there's something about this flag that opens that up. And I'd love to hear from all of you and about like, what is the idea of patriotism? And is there a way that we can make it feel normalized again, make it feel like an American thing rather than a party thing or an ideological thing? Um. Well, you know, I wanted my granddaughters to see this film. Um, I think so many young people take for granted the privilege of voting. And especially after this last election we had with so much turmoil going on, I wanted them to look back and see what people went through to get here, you know? And that's why I gave tribute to people like Ida B. Wells and uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, to see what people went through to get this privilege. And it's such a, a valuable, wonderful thing to participate in our political system. So, um, like I said, I really want my granddaughters to see this film. And um, incidentally, Marilyn, I bought one of my granddaughters a, a toy sewing machine for Christmas. <laughs> I thought that, you know, I would love to see her learn to sew. And I think the quilting, the the putting together this thing was such a beautiful, wonderful idea. And I, I don't know, I was inspired by you. <laughs> I love that, I love that. Yeah. Councilwoman Nice, I wanna ask you, do you feel that um, women's roles in politics on a local and national level, have they, ch has it changed over the last few years, have you are you seeing real change being made now? Absolutely. Um, obviously, it's it's going to come gradually. Uh, however, I can say with 2018, uh, we broke the glass ceiling as far as women that were elected to office, not only mm. on the federal level but also locally. And uh, for myself, I know for our state of Oklahoma we had our first African-American woman that ran for governor. We had our first African-American woman that ran for lieutenant governor. Uh, among myself being able to cast my ballot for not only these, these types of new things that have never been happening in our city or our state before, uh, but to, to see these women take ownership and say, this is what they want to do. Uh, although unfortunately they they were unsuccessful, but they did it. And uh, to the to to the point of Miss uh, Miss Bond, this is what representation looks like. So yes, yeah. uh, there there are still a lot of things we want to see done. And I I think even to what we saw in November, we saw the likes of a Congresswoman Cory Bush from Illinois who was on the front lines protesting and demanding. Uh, for some justice and some change. And now she is one of the policymakers. So it, it speaks wow. to where we can still uh, decide as far as women are concerned, not, not tell, let people tell us it's time, but we have to take ownership and say, yes, mm -hmm. this is what we need to do. And, and I'm gonna be the one to do it and normalize it at yes. the same time. Yes, that's, that's one. Yeah, in the film, you know, I say, we all know a woman that should be running for office. Every one of us does. Mm -hmm. And I know I had a woman in my life who um, she 
declared that she was going to run for office. And as soon as she did, I went, of course you are. Why didn't I think of it? You know, it's and encouraging other women to, to jump in there and we're going to fail. We're not going to get elected. You know, you just got to keep packing at it just like the suffrage fighters did. You know, they kept the, the amendment kept failing over and over and over and they just kept at it. So that's what we got to do as women get in there, get running and get writing policy. Continue wow. to create space um, to your point. To, we have to continue to create that space for other women. And I, I uh, reference other women that are in these roles like uh, Kamala Harris, who uh, this, she's the second senator to ever serve. You know, and I, I, in contrast, I'm the second woman of color to ever serve our city council. And actually, Miss Marilyn is one of my constituents. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's those types of, it's something about the first being able to break the ceiling to let us in, but it's just something about the seconds that come through after those first have made that path for us to help create the space for more to come. So it's in these types of her flag documentaries and just focusing and honing in on women uh, and the women that you have never heard of uh, to say these were the ladies who were a part of this movement. It gives names and recognition that we have been longing for for our country, especially in women's history for so long, those underrepresented women uh, who have not been able to have that voice. And now we can speak to that with this documentary of her flag. Yes, it's so inspirational. It really is. That's good. That's that's what we wanted. <laughs> I know my husband watched it the other day. He's seen it a million times and he cried for the, he was like, I was sitting in my office crying. <laughs> He's the best. <laughs> uh, I was like, that's so adorable. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> But it was, it was such a long journey for you, though. I, I really have to admire you from the beginning to the end and then COVID and yeah. what you went through to get it done. Uh, you really have to be commended for that. And it's a gift. It's a gift to our young people. And I, I'm, I'm proud to have been a part of it. I really am. I love hearing that. <laughs> oh, it makes all the work so worth it. Yeah, love that. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, Marilyn, can you talk a little bit about COVID and how that actually changed the scope of the project? Because you were more, um, more than halfway through yeah. or about yeah. halfway when COVID hit. Like, what did that do to like to, you know? Yeah, I mean, part of the, the one of the biggest ideas of the project was to get to travel to see the country and meet these other women artists. And really get to uh to see their perspective on on life and things i just never get enough meeting artists so you know to not be able to do that was was heart-wrenching um but you know there's this has been an 2020 was insane um you know yeah. major social upheaval um with the black lives matter movement i really felt like i needed to sit down and shut up and provide space so i had some issues just personally still trying to make space for um, her flag. So I, you know, <laughs> when so much was happening, so it was, uh, it was a rough, wacky, hard um, year for sure. And I had to bob and weave and, you know, uh, people were able to watch all over the world, the live streaming performances. So there was a little rainbow there. <laughs> So you just gotta, yeah, you gotta find the the positive point there, so. Yeah, well, I mean, there is something to be said about how um, going online and doing things like Zoom and doing performances online has actually, do you feel like it actually broadened your audience? Did it give you a more of a platform than you had originally when you were just going to each place? Yeah, I think in, in a lot of ways it did. People that were never going to see me, you know, do one of these. Now, grant you the online, because I'm alone in my living room, usually doing these, you know. Um, so they weren't as exciting as seeing the live performance with the performing artists and in a bit beautiful space. And I'm sure my energy was much different, um, you know, in, in the live performances. But um, 
yeah, getting to reach more people and then have it recorded where mm. people could go see it. And that wasn't happening when I was doing the live versions. Now, you know, there were some of the location, we didn't film in all the locations because they're just, you know, that would have been an insane amount of money. So we just tried to mm -hmm. pick, uh, pick locations and film where we could. Can you talk about what's happening with the project now? What and and the future of the project? Yeah. Where where is this flag going to live? Do you have an idea? So um, I and I know this will be shown a little bit later, but I'm supposed to drive to Washington D.C. tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it's I have complex feelings about all that with everything that's going on. But uh, the flag is supposed was supposed to hang during the inauguration, but due to everything that happened in DC, it's looking like it probably won't just because the city's on lockdown, you know, they're, they're super, and I absolutely, we need DC yeah. to be um, very cautious right now. So I'm waiting to hear today if it's gonna hang uh, during the inauguration or not. If not, it will hang later, but, uh, and I'm not, um, we have the agreement signed, but I haven't publicly said who and where it's hanging. Um, so I haven't done that yet. So I can't tell you guys, stay tuned for that. Um, go to her oh, okay. or our social media to, you know, uh, see where it ends up. But I would love for it, you know, we finally um, got funding passed for the Women's History Museum this year or in tw last year. And uh, I would love for her flag to go live at the Women's History Museum after it's built in DC. I mean, you gotta, you gotta think big, right? I'm thinking big. So, so that's what I would love for it to be. Mm. Well, that's fantastic because I know when we were talking, your goal was for the flag to hang during the inauguration and so fingers crossed that actually happens but it's it's almost that it, it's gonna hang in spirit regardless yeah there. yeah so <laughs> so if yeah as soon as it's safe they're gonna hoist hoist it up so onto the building onto a building so um we'll see yeah Marilyn, I wanted you to know that my mother, uh, she's 88 years old. And when you had it hanging at the Clinton Library in Little Rock, she got a chance to see it. So that was one of the few times she actually got out of the house since this COVID thing. She hasn't gone anywhere. But my sister drove by and rolled down the window and let her see it on the Clinton Library. So that was a real treat for her. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it was nice for, you know, COVID, you could at least drive by and see it. So uh, yeah, that's great. I love hearing that. Great. Um, and then one final question, I just, and I wanna open it up to all of you. Um, based on your experiences, you know, as, you know, working on the project and then also, you know, um, Nikki, you um, participating kind of in the film, like, do you have a do you have like a takeaway from all of this? Do you feel like um, I mean, I guess I, I asked Nicole and Higgins more this. Do you do you feel that this, working on this project has changed you in any way in the way you think about things or um, you know, in your world? Did you feel as as uh, motivated or do you feel motivated now than before you, before this whole thing started? The world has also changed so too drastically in the process of making this. So it's kind of more of maybe a broader question. Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I It's like putting history in perspective. You know, you reach back and honor these ladies uh, that fought for the right to vote and everything. And then it comes full circle when Kamala Harris is elected vice president. So, um, I think to just be part of that, and like I said, share it with my granddaughters, that to me has been the biggest reward of this, uh, to, to, for them to be able to see history turn like this. So it's, it's been important for me. It's been very important. I think for me as an artist, um, it started for me with the Women's March on Washington logos. So then when, when I, I was, 
going to participate in the her flag. I was like, of course I'm going to, right? That's that's the next thing. I'm going to continue to stay involved and 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 I think it's been I think it's been a, a bit of an awakening as an artist to know that my voice can be heard as an artist. I don't have to be a leader. I don't have to be um, you know, in every march, but I can show up in the ways that like that I have a passion and a talent for. And um, and now I'm actually working on a giant ERA project. So like that would have never happened. I mean, these are just connecting each other, you know, with each other and and being part of the her flag is is a huge, huge thing for me. And I would say to just to be featured alongside uh, Representative Cindy Munson, who is also serving as as women in Oklahoma. Um, obviously, it's it's rare, uh, and we are the few of our women of color that are serving in our state, not only on the state level, but also on the local level. So for her flag to be intentional about showcasing us, I'm forever grateful and thankful for and humbled to be a part and just to have the exposure of not only learning about artists such as Ms. Bond and Ms. LaRue, uh, but also Ms. Marilyn, you know, understanding uh, where her thoughts are, are coming from as far as being very intentional about the diversity aspect of what her flag looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing the history of a uh, hundred years prior uh, how it was very hard for those women, same women to be at the table, but they still made sure they were present. And for her to recognize, for Ms. Marilyn to recognize that and, and make sure that their ideas and even their names are spoken, even whether it be a sticker or whether it be on uh, one of those, those stripes, it, it means a lot. And obviously it's full circle because as, as we mm -hmm. heard, now here we are celebrating a woman that has never happened in the history of our country to be a vice president. I mean, it speaks volumes. So this is very timely um, and, and, and celebratory for uh, the women who helped to get us here to this point to say, Madam Vice President. Sure. Well, I know for me, um, you know, I'm really active. I was doing more gallery activist art, creating objects and statements and themes. And I think I'm really realizing my happy place is just full on activist art. And uh, kind of I've got a lot of ideas uh, churning. Um, so yeah, I definitely um, want to tackle some other, you know, equality, women's equality issues. I love that Nicole's working on this big ERA uh, project. So yeah, love that. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you all for chatting with us about her flag. Um, this has been a really great conversation. It's inspirational. And um, I really uh, wish all, everyone the best of luck in all of their activism, because I feel like it is so important um, today and um, especially uh, like at right and at this moment. So um, thank you all and um, bye. Thank you. It's good to see you guys. <laughs>